So it's nice to welcome Salman Hamid, uh, who is presently at Hampshire College. Um, he uh, started with a PhD in astronomy at New Mexico State, uh, but presently he's an ICE fellow here with Marcelo and his group uh, through May. And his research project here is that he's working on a book on Muslim perceptions of evolution. Uh, and in fact, there will be an ICE. ICE or ICE? ICE. ICE, okay. There will the be good ICE. There's the bad ICE. <laughs> <laughs> there will be an ICE talk, uh, particularly about that research work on May 18th, uh, also here. Um, but for today, he's going to talk about Monakia. Yes. yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and, and again, um, I've been here since uh, mid-January, so thank you very much uh, for the hospitality yes. of uh, Dartmouth and also uh, ICE, the good ICE, uh, that I'm here. Uh, if the bad ICE finds out that I'm here, that will be trouble. Um, oh, yeah, that would be great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, uh, as it was mentioned, uh, I, I do have, and, and it's interesting, normally uh, with talks. Uh, you don't talk about yourself. And uh, I gave a talk about, uh, I think, two weeks ago or last week. I don't know. Time just uh, is relative. Uh, I think it was last week, and it was about uh, Muslim science and the travel ban. And I talked about uh, sort of like, you know, my, my person, my me being coming from Pakistan and, uh, and uh, using that experience to talk about a little bit about the travel ban. So unfortunately, uh, I will again have to give a little bit of a note about the personal aspect. And that is that uh, my current research, as was mentioned before, looks at how Muslims perceive science in uh, Muslim societies. And in particular, I'm looking at uh, using uh, perception of evolution as a lens to understand the diversity. Uh, but I'm in general interested in the interaction of science and religion. But my PhD is in astronomy. And when I did astronomy, it had nothing to do with religion. It was pure astronomy. I, I worked on uh, observational astronomy. I did star formation in spiral galaxies. I used telescopes uh, predominantly in Chile. Uh, so I used CTIO. And also in uh, New Mexico, the Apache Point Observatory, and also uh, Kitt Peak. I worked also in the Spanish Canary Islands, and also used telescopes uh, a couple of times in Mauna Kea. So I had plenty of experience in terms of observing and in terms of uh, going to these telescopes. But for my postdoctoral work, I had my fellowship at Smith College and UMass. That's a five college astronomy uh, department. And uh, one of my responsibilities there as a fellow, five, as a postdoctoral fellow, was to develop a course on astronomy and public policy. This was early 2000. I started actually in 2001. And uh, the course, the originally, I mean, so, uh, so my advisors over there, uh, Susan Edwards um, uh, at Smith College, I mean, she had a vague idea of what policy and astronomy and policy would come in. And they wanted to develop a course on something like uh, the threat of asteroids. And because there have been congressional hearings about that, uh, especially again, with a larger context, in the post-Cold War context, uh, there was a lot of interest in blowing things up, which is not another country. And so it was like, hey, how about asteroids? And military was interested in it. But certainly, astronomers were also part of it. Well, you know, we can be, uh, there can be a threat. Uh, there was uh, a relatively bad movie, Deep Impact, and then awful movie, Armageddon, that came out in the, in the mid-1990s. So that stuff was already going on. So, as part of that course, one of the things was to look at how the Congress thinks about astronomy think, and, and how astronomers and, or scientists and astronomers and congressmen talk to each other. Uh, and we also looked at another area was, uh, for example, search for life in the universe. And it was fascinating to read congressional hearings. Usually congressional hearings are boring, but actually those were fascinating because you can totally see how they're, pa they're talking past each other. Completely, and just by reading the transcripts. I mean, actually, the Q and A section. Actually, those, actually, I would recommend con reading congressional hearings because the transcripts are good. Not the prepared statements. Prepared statements are terrible, boring. But when there is an actual interaction, they are actually really insightful. So, as part of that course, when we were developing it, I had read an article in 2099, I think, uh, in, Sin uh, in Sky and Telescope, 
that there's something going on in Mauna Kea, there is a new plan that's coming up, and there are native Hawaiians, and, and there are some environmental issues, and something is going on. So while I was developing the course, I suggested, well, I think we should include this particular topic of Mauna Kea in science and, and astronomy and public policy, because this, is, this gives you a different insight. Usually when we talk about astronomy and policy, we are usually talking about funding. We are talking about whether, uh, should we spend money on this telescope or not? But Mauna Kea was a different issue, because the question was, if we spend money on a telescope or on telescopes, it comes at the expense of something else. There is a negative associated with that, which we as astronomers, and here I talked about multiple identities here, as we, I'm talking about we as astronomers, have to think about. Usually we are just like, hey, you know, we are answering humanity some of fundamental questions. We should spend money on it. And we argue about how to value it, and, like, you know, that, and, and we always justify astronomy based upon the fundamental universal value of learning about the universe, because it tells us about who we are. So that's the context that we frame in. But Mauna Kea, again in 2000, I mean, it was like something else, because there was these rights issues that were coming up. So that's the context of why my interest in this topic was there. Um, and so I'm going to talk about that. Let's see. It's not moving. I'll go with the old-fashioned way. Okay. All right. So uh, first, just uh, uh, because it's an astronomy talk, uh, I don't give many talks in colloquia. So, like you know, so uh, so just for old time's sake, here's the outline even though it's going to meander a little. But, but what I want to do is to set it up as, well, what is the controversy? How did we get here in terms of the controversy? Uh, because by now, if I was giving this talk a few years ago, before 2014, I would have to explain to you that there is something going on at Mauna Kea. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, now I don't have to explain that there is something going on at Mauna Kea because I'm sure that you have heard that there is something going on. So I'm going to explain it to you. How did we get there? Uh, and then uh, I'm going to place it in the context, well, is this an issue of science versus religion? And then are there any solutions to that? So let's just uh, start with a, uh, with a pretty picture. Uh, for astronomers, it gives goosebumps looking at pictures like this. Uh, the first time uh, I went to uh, Mauna Kea, when you are flying on the plane, you look at it and it gives you chills because for astronomers, seeing white dots on a mountain are like, wow, that's the telescope. Right? And remember, it's, it's an artificial structure, right? I mean, so, so, so within the context of it, look at nature. This is nature. I mean, we got Hawaii, that's what people associate with. When we look at it, we go like, wow. Look at that white dot on the mountain. It's amazing, right? And, and so for astronomers, I mean, there is, the, there is this excitement. And uh, I used uh, JCMT, the James Clock Maxwell Telescope, uh, over there. Uh, and yeah, it was, it was exciting. Uh, you land on, um, on the Kona side, on the beach side. It's warm. You can go to the beach. And then you uh, go up uh, about an hour and a half drive. And you are up at 14,000 feet. So it's amazing. And here are all the telescopes right now on the mountain. So the controversy that I'm going to be uh, uh, addressing is about the construction of a 30 meter telescope. So right now, the two biggest telescopes or the twin telescopes that are right now here are the Keck observatories. They have their mirror size. It's 10 meters in diameter. Uh, they are, for a while, they used to be the biggest optical telescope in the world. Uh, they no longer are the biggest, but pretty close, second biggest. And these are uh, twin telescopes. Those are the, uh, uh, the domes there. Okay, so those are the telescope. Uh, so this is the design for the 30 meter telescope. It has been uh, in the works for, uh, for a while. And, um, uh, and the, they, had, they looked at facilities all around the world and also mountaintops and places where they, you could be uh, observing all around the world. There were two finalists. One was, uh, one was in Chile, 
uh, at uh, uh, I think 12,000 feet, 14,000 feet, I think, uh, up high in the uh, in the Atacama Desert, and the second uh, and the second place was Mauna Kea in Hawaii, and uh, they picked Mauna Kea in Hawaii as the place where they are going to place uh, the 30 meter telescope. And this is from uh, the, uh, how, uh, this uh, TMT, the short form for 30 meter telescope. Astronomers are great with names. Uh, and so there are, here is the, from their publicity material, it says like, you know, Mauna Kea, best place in the world for astronomy. Transforming our knowledge of the universe, this is the telescope, 13 times the resolution of Hubble Space Telescope. Okay, so, th so this is a big deal. This is the next generation optical telescope. Oh, it says that. Here is the next generation uh, technology, okay. Uh, but then it also has some few items that you might be like, oh, what? Like, you know, no impact on aqu uh, aquifer and then $800,000 a year lease rent goes to stewardship of Mauna Kea. Nevertheless, that's what was going on. Uh, it, about the, the project sort of like, you know, they started thinking decades ago. Uh, but certainly in the late 1990s and early 2000s, it was in the planning, and it looked like Mauna Kea seemed to be a natural place for a telescope uh, such as the 30 meter telescope. But then something happened. And from there, this is from 2014, uh, at the groundbreaking ceremony of the 30 meter telescope, the road was blocked by protesters. and. Right now, the telescope, it looks like it's not going to be there, but we don't know. We're going to get to it in a, uh, in a, in a little bit. But there were protesters, and then there was this uh, social media uh, movement. We are Mauna Kea. Uh, this, by the way, and, and, and like, you know, if you are a Game of Thrones fan, uh, then, uh, then uh, he was the uh, Khaleesi's uh, husband. Like, you know. No Game of Thrones fans? Drogo. 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 So yeah, he's actually Hawaiian and also Drogo. But uh, anyway, so yeah, so he's in there and people are actually have written, uh, we are Mauna Kea. Now, uh, just to clarify, they are not saying we are Mauna Kea because of the 30 meter telescope, okay? Uh, because you can also say, hey, we are TMT. Oh, anyway, but they're not saying that. So the question is, how did we get from here, from all this promising business of looking at uh, groundbreaking technology, a uh, telescope that is so much more sophisticated or, or sensitive than Hubble Space Telescope to this? So let's go back uh, in, uh, in astronomy history uh, a little bit. So astronomy in Hawaii actually didn't start way back, uh, at least modern astronomy that we are talking about. Uh, Kuiper, uh, in 1963, uh, visited uh, Hawaii. At that time, they were, the mountain was pristine. There were no telescopes on the mountain. He looked at it and he says, the mountaintop is probably the best site in the world. I repeat, in the world, from which to study the moon, planets, and stars. This was 1963, and, and indeed, a few years later, uh, 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 well, I'll, I'll tell you in a, in a second, in, in a few years later, uh, actually, the Institute of uh, uh, Astronomy at University of Hawaii uh, indeed formed just a few, I think 1967. But the reason why astronomers love Mauna Kea is because of a few factors that are unique to it. One of it is that when you are putting a telescope, you would like it to be, uh, the air to be clean and dry air. There is not much pollution over there if you are in the middle of the Pacific. Uh, and you also want it to have steady temperatures. Those are all, all really uh, important things uh, that, uh, that, that you want to have. You also want low light pollution. Again, no, a no brainer regarding that. Uh, in fact, when it's cloudy on the Big Island, it is actually great for observing uh, because the clouds actually shield whatever light there is from underneath because these cinder cones of, and the peak, the Mauna Kea, actually peaks out from, the, from below. And so the clouds are below. So clouds are actually great for astronomy. Um, I've observed in the uh, same thing in, in Chile as well. I've, I've observed uh, in thunderstorms. And, and in fact, there was some problem because you can have actually lightning polluting, like, you know, light coming out to your telescope, but usually you can have lightning underneath and you have a beautiful clear sky for observing. So, so certainly you have uh, this as a great thing. But then this particular aspect about atmospheric stability, that's a really important component 
Because if you are trying to focus on something really small, uh, you want as steady of an atmosphere as possible. And uh, again, places like uh, Chile, uh, for example, are great because on one side you have uh, the Pacific Ocean, and so it smooths the air. And usually when astronomers say, well, the seeing is bad, meaning to say the atmospheric turbulence is higher, in Chile, for example, usually the wind is coming from the wind direction is from the side of the mountains. And so you have a bumpy uh, air. Well, in Hawaii, you have this 14,000 foot peak, really high peak, surrounded by an ocean. And so from that perspective, it really provides a unique uh, place to do uh, high-end astronomy. And Kuiper noted that, and, uh, and, and, that uh, and that resulted in a lot of uh, astronomy. So how did astronomy continue? How did astronomy develop in Hawaii? Well, in, uh, 19, uh, in 1967, the Institute of Astronomy, as I mentioned, was established in University of Hawaii. But soon after, they signed a 65, University of Hawaii, signed a 65-year lease for all land above 12,000 feet elevation uh, and Mauna Kea. And they said, well, I mean, that, and, and, and the key aspect is that it's a lease, sure. It runs up till 2033. And it is for the development, there's a Mauna Kea science park, uh, which has other aspects as well. But certainly, astronomy was the central uh, component of that. So until December tw uh, 2033, this is the part of the lease uh, agreement. The university will not appropriate, damage, remove, excavate, uh, defigure, deface, or destroy any object of antiquity, prehistoric ruin, or monument of historical and uh, value, and must keep the area clean and orderly. Okay, so this is 1968. Uh, this is the lease is being signed, and it says failure to comply with these requirements give Hawaiian Board of uh, Land and Natural uh, Resources. The acronym for that is, by the way, BLNR, uh, but not the astronomy one, not the AGNs, because we were talking about, so it's not the broadline nuclear region, but it's uh, a board of land and natural resources, the right to claim the summit at, uh, at uh, a six-month notice. Okay. So that's, that was the heat lease that was signed. Now, in terms of the history of Hawaii, which we're going to come back to in a little bit later, just in a context, Hawaii became a state in 1959. So this is soon after that this land has been uh, leased to University of Hawaii. Um, and then in 1977, uh, there was a revision to the plan. So there have been a couple of revisions to this particular original plan. The first master plan uh, was determined. And at that time, for the first time, there were concerns about uh, native Hawaiian voices. In the first one, there were objections to it. But really, Native Hawaiian voices were never really considered in the original bid. But in 1977, there was a little bit more uh, reception to, uh, they were a little bit more receptive to that. And the f in 1977, plan said that to determine the compatibility of Mauna Kea's resources to accommodate various uses without unacceptable damage to the biotic and other natural and historical values and the visual appearance of the mountain. So there was this concern that we are putting and at that time, by the way, there are only few telescopes up on the mountain. Okay, so again, the picture that I showed was more recent. Even in 1970s, I think there was only one or two telescopes. Uh, and uh, that's it. The rest of the mountain was still relatively pristine. And, uh, but there is this other issues that are coming up, biotic and other natural and historical values. So you have to start thinking about the mountain in a slightly different way. And in 1983, there was another revision to it, and now, there was something else that was uh, starting to take place. And one of them was uh, that you have to minimize visibility of observatories from developed areas of the island. Okay. Now, why is that the case? Well, University of Hawaii got this lease for this best place in the world to do astronomy. And so in order to entice others to build telescopes on the mountain, University of Hawaii said, look, here is a mountain which is best for astronomy. We will give you lease for $1 a year. You can come and build a telescope up on the mountain for $1 a year lease. But in return, University of Hawaii is going to get 
of observing time. Now, in monetary value, I mean, there is no monetary exchange taking place directly. Okay, there, I mean, one dollar. Yes, you take one dollar. And University of Hawaii, anybody who builds a telescope over there, and so there is a, uh, there's a Japanese telescope, uh, Subaru, there are, there are, there's a Canada, France, Hawaii telescope, uh, the Keck telescope, any observatory that is built on top of Mauna Kea, they get the land for one dollar a year. But the time of the telescope, which is very valuable for astronomy, goes to University of Hawaii. And sure enough, it attracted some of the world's best instruments on the mountain. And it transformed University of Hawaii Astronomy Department from the backwaters into one of the leading astronomy institutes in the world. Okay? But this is the key thing. But because there was a lot of interest in building telescopes, so there was this another thing like, you know, that, okay, you can build a telescope. But it should not be visible because one of the concerns for Native Hawaiians was that from the dry side, and that's the Kona side, uh, like, you know, because, they, uh, because some Hawaiians worship as nature, as a mountain. We're going to come back to it uh, in a little bit later. They did not want to see artificial structures on the mountains. And so one of the ideas is like, you know, you want to minimize like, you know, visibility from developed areas of the island. Now, remember, as I mentioned, it gives you goosebumps because as astronomers, you come in and you go like, hey, that's really cool. That's where we are going. That's where the structures are. But that's exactly the opposite of what they want. Second thing was, there was a maximum of 13 telescopes uh, that would be on the summit through the year 2000. And they, and they added, like, you know, at that time in 1983, there were six telescopes uh, already there. And they said, okay, but 13 is the maximum until the year, through the year 2000. And then we're going to see what happens later. Okay. And the other thing that was added was, instead of just University of Hawaii giving permission, any proposed structure or construction on the summit must now meet the approval of the Mauna Kea Management Board. And so there was a board that comprises some locals and some University of Hawaii officials, and they said, well, it has to be one of them. Okay. So that's where we are in 1983. And things start to get actually interesting. It's getting warm here. Hey, Salman, this last uh, item there, was that part of the 1983 or that came in? 1983, yes. Oh, okay. It's in the beginning. So, all right. Well, just happens by complete coincidence <laughs> uh, that I'm wearing. Uh, so if you want to look at the mirrors that are the telescope that is there by the year 2000, here it is. There you go. Okay. <laughs> so here are these different mirrors that are on the telescope. And this is a Mauna Kea t-shirt that actually tells you about all, and like, you know, about astronomy on the mountain. Uh -huh. And here are all the telescopes that are out there and the great stuff that we can do. Okay, so, but in the late, in the, by the time mid-1990s came along, uh, there were some challenges to, the, uh, to Mauna Kea, to astronomy that were coming up. Uh, one of them was uh, some shrines. There were, uh, there are, uh, I mean, there are, uh, there are uh, interesting, uh, there, are, there are multiple issues about what is the exact number of shrines of native Hawaiians that are up there. Partly because, according to native Hawaiian, um, and again, I, I don't want to use religion, and I don't want to use that all native Hawaiians. For some native Hawaiians, the peak of the mountain is so sacred that normal humans cannot go up there. It's only reserved for the priests. Second, you don't want to leave any artificial objects up there. So they would create, they would have uh, shrines, but usually made up of uh, wood and shrubs and things like that. But they would also not declare where those are because it is for the gods. So there are a number of shrines that were there. And th the question was, and, and every time a new telescope is being built, Immediately, the question was, are there any shrines that have been destroyed or disturbed? Remember, in the original lease item, it said that it should not be destroyed. But it was tricky because the locations of shrines was not identified. And telescopes, usually the big structure, so for example, if you're talking about the Keck Observatory, I mean, you have to dig deep into the mountain 
in order to create structures that are big, that are multi-story structures that you are building. And so in order to go down in the mountain, you are taking out a lot of material with that. So that was one of the challenges that were coming out. And, uh, and the question was like, you know, that first of all, I mean, there is this juxtaposition uh, uh, that when there is an access for Native Hawaiians to go up and still pray at the mountain. Uh, but uh, how many people have been to the peak of Mauna Kea? I mean, if you go up there, uh, I mean, it's, first of all, I mean, it's spectacular. It's amazing. But you also have roads over there, right up on top. And you also have this humming sound, uh, which looks like you're on the deck of uh, Enterprise. It's like, mm, and that's because of all the observatories uh, that are out there. So there is this uh, juxtaposition that come up between the shrines, if you are going to there, um, and others. Then there is a sacred lake. I mean, there are other, other things as well, but there is a lake which for Native Hawaiians, they consider uh, sacred. Uh, they deposit, for example, placenta uh, over there and for other things that is also close to the telescope. It's a nice walk that you can actually go uh, over there. And then there is this tiny little bug. Its name is Waikio, Waikio bug, uh, which only lives in the entire world the only place it lives is on top of Mauna Kea. Well, it, it is actually a pretty cool bug because it has antifreeze in its blood because it's so cold up there. And, um, and one of its major enemies is dust because it's already pretty dry up there. And if dust blows, uh, then it decimates the LAQ population. Now, in the mid-1990s, uh, there was a lot of concern about, uh, about this particular organism. And um, it was put on the candidate for endangered species. Okay. Now, as I'm going to talk uh, a little bit uh, about this a little bit later, the issue is now things are changing, but at least at, in the 90s and also up until a few months ago, environmental issues were seriously taken. And so the uh, Endangered Species Act actually meant something. And in fact, I mean, if, if this species was declared to be an endangered species, then probably both astronomers or Native Hawaiians would not be allowed to go up on the mountain. Because Endangered Species Act trumps all other things. Not trump, trumps. OK, so, so that aspect is, uh, uh, is there. So, so this wake you bug actually became a central feature in some of the objections to the telescope construction in the 1990s because telescope constructions kick up dust. And the question was, how much of the population of Wake bug is being destroyed? Okay. That was in the 1990s. And, uh, and the census numbers of how many bugs are there uh, was never clear. It, it was even uh, taking place in the, in the early 2000s. And the, the researchers who were conducting the census on Wake bug was from University of Hawaii. And so there was always this uh, suspicion that are they really counting all the bugs or not? And uh, I did some interviews in, uh, in the mid-2000s. And I kind of got do be a sense it's like, yeah, the actual population is kind of low, but we're not talking about it. Because again, again, if Endangered Species Act kicks in, then it's a serious problem. I did make a mistake uh, in one of my interviews with the Mauna Kea Management Board. And I, I just, I misspoke. And I said, like, you know, endangered species. And the person immediately just stood up and said, no, no. It's on the, can it's a candidate for endangered species, not an endangered species. Because that's a big difference between the two. So this is 1990s. Now, Astronomy is familiar with these kind of debates uh, that has happened before. And so in early 1990s, there was another controversy that happened at Mount Graham in Arizona. This is the Mount Graham uh, Observatory now. And over there, we had similar issues. So instead of the Wake U bug, one of the concerns was this red squirrel. And it was the red squirrel controversy. Now, Mount Graham is also on uh, a native American lands, and this was an Apache tribe uh, that is over there. And uh, that issue started in the, mid, in the late 1980s. And the telescope said, well, or the University of Arizona was involved in this. And the University of Arizona said, well, we have sent the usual notifications to the tribes. And they've said, like, you know, uh, we are going to build this telescope, uh, uh, this, these observatories. And if you have any claim, you should come back in the court and claim it. 
uh, the claims go unanswered. And it's a tricky aspect because uh, one of the things with native religions, and again, I don't want to generalize it, but one of the principles they go by is that, well, you cannot own natural things. So you cannot own a mountain. So they, they didn't respond uh, earlier on to make a claim in a court that actually this is sacred to us. Nevertheless, in the early 1990s, uh, 1990, 91, uh, it became a serious issue and environmentalists and Native Hawaiian groups joined together against astronomers. Now, the reason why there is a cartoon here which says there's a pope and he says, well, ha, you call that sacred? Uh, that is because one of the telescopes that was uh, part of that, one of the observatories, was owned by the Vatican. Uh, and uh, for some, the Pope scope, yes. And for some interesting reason, and again, I'm, I'm going to talk about the tone deafness that's going to come back again. Uh, the project was called Project Columbus. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so here is a Vatican observatory building an observatory named Project Columbus on Native American lands, right? So you have a con beautiful confluence of all of these things. Uh, nevertheless, uh, that was uh, an issue over there. Now, in, uh, but I should mention, they, because of the Red Squirrel, actually they moved the observatories to a newer location, which actually was better for the squirrels. But, the environmental group actually, I think it was the Sierra group, uh, they actually sued uh, the telescope because they said, it's not in the, in the original location. The original location was allowed, the, the original permission was given for the original location. Now you have changed it. And hence you cannot build the telescope, even though the changed location was actually better for the red squirrels. Okay. So this was actually a really messy fight between uh, University of Arizona and a leading University of Arizona leading it and then the Vatican, the University of Hawaii, Ohio was included as well, and environmentalists and Native Americans. Nobody came out of this uh, battle uh, unscarred. And they all came out to be, they were all messy. Uh, nevertheless, in 1993, I think 93 or 94, uh, it was actually uh, uh, Clinton, uh, Bill Clinton at that time, he actually uh, signed a letter like, you know, voiding some of the environmental uh, re uh, requirements for this. And, the observatory was built uh, over there. So Mount Graham Observatory uh, was built in the 1990s, but this was an acrimonious uh, decision. Uh, and at that time, uh, Eddie Vedder of Pearl Jam, he went out and like, you know, he took off his shirt and like, you know, yelled at things like, you know, uh, so anyway, and at that time, Pearl Jam was huge. So anyway, I mean, today you can do that, but people will not notice that. Drogo on the other hand. Okay, so, uh, okay. So that is a backdrop. Astronomers knew about Mount Graham Observatory in the early 1990s. Mauna Kea, when these th things started to come, that was the backdrop. People knew that we have to be careful. That, astronomers didn't do that good in that particular issue. So if we are in Mauna Kea, let's learn our lessons and do it better. But here was the problem. Remember one of the things was that uh, structures should not be visible from the Kona side? Well, actually, I was there, and I took this picture from uh, close to the beach, and you can actually look up, and you go like, hey, that's those are the telescopes. So you can actually clearly see that. Um, <clears throat> but then there was another issue of uh, counting. Now, astronomers are supposed to be good with counting. You usually go like, hey, I, can, I know how many telescopes are there. The limit is 13. How hard can it be? <laughs> yeah, yes. Uh, it is. So here is uh, the, the, I think that's the Caltech 7 millimeter uh, observatory. And uh, they said, aha, here is one. <laughs> okay. And as you can see, it's one. And then I think even more egregious was this. So the argument that people were making uh, was that the Keck twin telescopes are one telescopes because they work, they can work together. Okay, as I was joking actually before lunch also, it's like, you know, if you have twins, you say, I'm going to pay price for one at the daycare center because there's just one basically, right? <laughs> so, uh, so the problem was that they said, well, like, you know, uh, Keck is just one. And then this is just one. 
And so we are still short of one observatory, actually. It's only 12. Uh, and, and that, you can imagine this is, uh, lightheartedly we can talk about this, but obviously for people who are concerned about the state of the mountain, uh, that doesn't go over well. But that was actually an argument presented that actually astronomy, because interferometry started to come online in optical. That's in the mid-1990s, and so a little bit before that. And so the question was like, you know, that can we do that? And the, how do you count these things? That's the issue. Now, the original intent of limiting telescopes was that how much footprint did you have on the mountain? Not that, oh, look, now we can combine these telescopes. And so that's what actually started to make people upset a little, okay? So let's go back a little bit into history of why people are so upset. That just upset people. But now place a little bit more context um, of why we went from the promise of the 30 meter telescope to roadblock at the construction of this break, uh, breaking ground for a 30 meter telescope. And so just, uh, I mean, of course, Hawaii population is older. Uh, Hawaii has been inhabited from uh, 400 to 700 AD. We don't exactly know when first Polynesians arrived, uh, but it was uh, uninhabited. Actually, that was the last place actually on Earth that people actually populated it. Uh, but then uh, Captain Cook's encounter was in uh, 17, um, um, 1777 and 1778 when he uh, got over there and he was killed uh, over there. Fascinating debate in anthropology of why he was killed. Uh, and, uh, and so that's, uh, that's, again, that's a whole other uh, debate regarding that, but nevertheless, uh, he, was, uh, he was killed. There is a monument to Captain Cook over there, which is uh, actually a British land. So there is this tiny little land, which is actually British territory next to the Big Island, uh, but that's where the Captain Cook monument is. Um, but then the key aspect is Captain Cook opened up for other traders uh, to, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from Japan, from uh, the US, from England, to come over there. And, and immediately, there was a lot of uh, missionary activity over there as well. And so in the mid-1880s, uh, there were a lot of missionaries and traders that were uh, on, uh, on the island of Hawaii. But in uh, 1893, um, uh, there was this queen, Lilia Kalani, uh, who tried to uh, sort of like limit some of their activities. And uh, there was a coup. Uh, by, taken over by the Marines uh, on the, at the behest of some of the American businessmen. This was not authorized by the U.S. government, but the Queen was put into prison. And the president of the U.S. at the time, and again, I'm sipping uh, his, na his name, but he actually said that this was terrible. And he says, like, you know, the Marines should not have done that, and we should give this land back to Hawaiians. This was uh, 1893 uh, when this coup happened. Uh, but, uh, but as with the government now, as was the case of the government then, uh, then the next elections happened and the president changed. And the next president was less interested in Hawaii. And then in uh, 1898, you're like, eh, it's ours. Okay, and so it was officially annexed in 1898. And from 1898 uh, to 1959, it was kind of, a, it was a U.S., uh, to a certain degree, it was a U.S. colony. And in, in 1959, it was officially uh, designated as a state. Now, there are a couple of things uh, embedded in there. And one of them is that the introduction of Captain Cook uh, to uh, Hawaii also brought uh, with him, as was the case with uh, Columbus uh, and the other invaders, major diseases that came with that, and that wiped out more than two-thirds of the Native Hawaiian population that existed before Captain Cook uh, got there. A uh, second component that we should keep in mind is that in the early, 19, in the early 20th century, um, the language of Hawaii, Hawaiian language was officially banned from teaching, so you could not speak or teach in schools. And that ban actually existed, that ban existed until the 1980s. Right. So uh, there is this history of how Hawaii became part of the US. Now, remember the lease that was taken, uh, that was signed by University of Hawaii? Well, that was on what they call the ceded lands. Those were the lands that were taken 
by the royal family. And so those are called the monarchic lands or ceded lands. And Hawaiians want them back for Hawaii, but those lands are actually taken by the US. And so the telescopes are built on those ceded lands that belong to, at that time, to the royal uh, kingdom. So that provides a little bit of a context of uh, where we are. But here is one key difference between Mount Graham controversy and the controversy on Mauna Kea. Native Americans, America actually declared a war on Native Americans. And there was an actual treaty that was signed with Native Americans. And so they were in reservations and things. And that was a genocide that was horrible. But there was an actual treaty. Well, in the Hawaiian case, the problem is that the US never declared an official war. Therefore, the US never uh, never entered into any treaty with Native Hawaiians. And so they fall somewhere in between when we talk about reparations or we talk about land rights. It's sort of somewhere in the middle. And so in order to correct that, in 1977 or 78, I, I forgot, like, you know, there was an Office of Hawaiian Affairs was, uh, was instituted. And the idea for, you know, uh, for Office of Hawaiian Affairs was that it would take care of Hawaiian, native Hawaiian issues. And one of the things was that any money made from ceded lands, 20% will go to the development of native Hawaiians. Okay? So for every dollar spent, 20 cents go to native Hawaiians. Remember the lease for, to entice other observatories to get onto Hawaii to build telescopes? How much was the lease? One dollar. So literally, they said like, you know, in the House of Hawaiian Affairs, like, you know, that you would get 20 cents on every dollar. Literally, Native Hawaiians got 20 cents for every observatory that got built. Okay? Now, it's not that it was free for University of Hawaii, because the University of Hawaii is getting telescope time, which translates into grants, which translates into overheads and things like that. But Office of Hawaiian Affairs get literally 20 cents on a telescope that is built over there. But it is complicated, okay, because astronomy is the second largest economy of the Big Island. It plays a huge role because it has all these observatories. So that is true. And this is the TMT uh, saying like, you know, TMT was actually the first observatory that promised that we are actually, even though we are not required to, they also said that, even though we are not required to because we can only get our land in one, for $1, uh, but they said we are going to actually pay a million dollar per year rent, which is a big deal, okay? Nevertheless, the, the complicated aspect is that Hawaii, in Hawaii, astronomy is the second largest economy. But it still doesn't exactly translate into a booming economy over there. And part of the reason is that when you have international uh, observatories or even national observatories, say for example uh, Caltech or Santa Cruz or whatever, I mean you would like to hire the people that they're coming from your district or from your university or from other places. So yes, it, even though it is a big economy, astronomy, it doesn't exactly transform Hawaiian economy either. Uh, and in fact, Hilo, which is where all of the observatory offices are located with the exception of the Keck Observatory, uh, Hilo is one of the poorest locales in the United States. So it never really transformed. Uh, and, and even with the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, I mean, one of the motivations for that was because there was a tsunami that devastated uh, Hilo in the uh, 1960s. And so one of the ways was like, you know, well, there are ways to fix it. And one was this. So anyway, so this is uh, uh, TMT PR thing. And why TMT had a PR? Because of Mount Graham Observatory. Because they learned that, you know, that we need to listen to people. And some of the other telescopes that were built uh, on, uh, on Mauna Kea, they didn't really ask Native Hawaiians. But actually, the 30-meter telescope, to its credit, they actually held many, 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 many meetings. And this is one of the hearings uh, for the telescope going on. In fact, there was a comprehensive management plan. This was in 2009. It explicitly acknowledged Mauna Kea can be considered the Pico Okahe, the single naval, which ensures spiritual connections, genealogical connection, the rights to the regenerative powers of the, all that is Hawaii. It is from the world's naval that the Hawaii axis emerges. So actually, they, right in the preface, they acknowledge the native Hawaiian 
right to a certain degree to Mauna Kea, okay? Uh, and so they had actually many meetings. Uh, but I should mention that while they are holding meetings, astronomers are still a little bit tone deaf, especially in the 1990s, because there was another project uh, called Outriggers, which was supposed to be small telescopes that ring around the Keck Observatory. And that was a, that later on uh, got canceled. But this is a problem because Outriggers is a Polynesian um, ships that, that use the riggers to cross. And so it was considered as culturally insensitive appropriating symbols from the native Hawaiians. Uh, there was also a, the nickname for 30 meter telescope in the mid 1990s officially on the newspaper, a statement being given was that this telescope is going to be God, giant optical device, okay? And it's just like you read these things, and this is the late 1990s, and you read this and you're like, oh no, I, you know, so anyway. Um, okay, so that gets us, I'm, I'm finishing up, that gets us to August uh, 2014. Uh, it looked like, so 30 meter telescope consortium actually made, uh, did a lot of hearings. And uh, I've, I, I, did, I, I went there in uh, 2008, 2009, and like, you know, it looked like, yes, there can be a better thing, but TMT looked inevitable. And yes, there were objections, but it looked inevitable. And certainly the, the, uh, the uh, and, and, and I should mention, there are a lot of native Hawaiians who also think telescope is a good thing because of economy, because of education. TMT also said that we are going to invest a million dollar a year in education, okay? So it's, it's a very hard topic, right? And so by 2014, it looked like it's going to happen. The governor had given, a governor didn't veto the plan and it was going forward. But suddenly, in, 20, in, August, uh, in, sorry, in April of 2014, on the way, when, on the groundbreaking ceremony, there were protesters that blocked the road. Now, that was unusual. And uh, nevertheless, they did uh, block it. Here are some uh, pictures from there. Uh, and then in July, uh, one of the largest protests that happened, about 700 people showed up. And in fact, 12 people were arrested. And that was a really, I mean, if you look at uh, YouTube, uh, I was actually looking at these things. I mean, if you look at clips of that, these policemen are also Hawaiians, many of them native Hawaiians. They're from the same family. And so and one of them is arresting, and first of all, he pays his, his homage to this elder gentleman. He says, like, you know, and then he says, I have to put you under arrest because they're not leaving from the road. Okay? So that happened. Uh, and and on, the, on the other hand, fiber optic cables in, in one of the telescopes got cut. So there was also this concern that some of the protesters had vandalized. But overall, actually the protests had been peaceful. Nevertheless, it started to build bigger and bigger, okay? Um, sorry, yeah. And so right at the height of the protests, uh, this was an email that was sent by Sandy Faber, uh, which was, this email was forwarded by Alex Filipenko. There were 200 people on that email. And the email started, dear friends, uh, this, is, this was, by the way, Alex, Alex Farapanko, from Sandy Faber, but I support what she says. Dear friends, the 30 meter telescope is in trouble. Attacked by a horde of native Hawaiians who are lying about the impact of the project on mountain, who are now threatening the safety of TMT personnel, and so on and so forth. Well, this uh, particular uh, email actually got public. There were 200 people, and uh, some of them actually said, like, you know, that they should immediately apologize. Uh, it took a while because initially they apologized in private, but then eventually they actually apologized in, uh, in public uh, as well. Uh, but even the apology had some issues because there was some sort of like, you know, uh, lecturing on democracy, how democracy works and things like that. So that was also an issue. But I think this was misreading of the cultural situation. And that's where I want to end with because things changed and that something triggered and TMT and the protest against it went international. And so We Are Mauna Kea actually became a big deal. Now, I've actually run out of time, so what I'm gonna do is, so the question is, two things, where do we go from here? But even before that, why did it become such a big deal? And the answer to that is that it's actually not about 30 meter telescope. Astronomers see that as about 30 meter telescope. Because we see, oh my goodness, this telescope, how is it going to do? Whenever it comes up, we talk about 
it's how many things we are going to know. We can push back, uh, look back time, and, and like, you know, we're going to be uh, finding earliest galaxies, maybe life, like, you know, maybe atmospheres with uh, biosignatures and so on and so forth. Right, but for Hawaiians, it's not about what a telescope does, but what a telescope stands for. And for them, it's about nationhood. And that is the context of going all the way that when the lease was signed in 1967 or 68, Hawaii was, as a state, was less than 10 years old. And Native Hawaiians had no voice in it at all. Remember, up until 1980s, they couldn't even speak their own language. Right? So in that context, over the period of time, their sense of, and this is their words, nationhood is big, it has been bubbling up, which really got a kick in, in, 19, in, in, uh, in 1993, uh, 1992, when President Clinton officially, uh, 1993, sorry, Pre President Clinton officially apologized for the illegal takeover of Hawaii in 1893. And that actually really gave it for the Hawaiian movement, Hawaiian national movement, actually, a bit of a kick. So certainly, that played a role. So it's not about astronomy, but astronomers, because you are astronomers here, astronomers have to know that it's not about astronomy. We sometimes think, why are these people anti-science? Why are these people anti-astronomy? That's, if you look at the coverage, the statements that come out and say, why are these people anti-astronomy? No, people are not anti-astronomy. There's a much bigger aspect that is going on. So where are we right now? Well, as of, uh, I, I just read a few days ago, uh, this has been, uh, so Hawaiian Supreme Court uh, listened to the arguments late in December of last year, and it overturned the approval that was given by BLNR, uh, the, the Board of Land and Natural Resources. They had given the permission, Hawaiian Supreme Court overturned it. Now, there is no way 20 years ago they would have overturned it. But now that it, partly because of, uh, of the protests, and they said the f real r right processes were not taking place the way they went about getting the permission. And again, because, and I, again, when I interviewed also, I mean, for me, that was the sense also, it's inevitable, but TMT has to go through these steps. That's what it clearly looked like. It's getting hard again, I have to, let's see. Okay. When I went in, oh, oh, I did by accident. I wore this uh, turtleneck, not because I'm a fan of Carl Sagan, uh, but um, in in 19 uh, in, in in 2007 or 8, when I went there, it, this was still in a nascent. Uh, the protests were still pretty nascent, and one of the switch, uh, this turtleneck that I got was it's called Pop the Pimples, and these are the pimples. Okay. I'm just giving you two different ways of looking at the same mountain. You have the proud moment of all these telescopes up on the mountain with the sizes. And then you also have pop the pimples, which because what they call pimples are the white dots that are on the red mountain. Okay. So just last month, a few weeks ago actually, uh, it appears that TMT is, instead of going being in Hawaii, it's going to be in the Spanish Canary Islands, in La Palma, where already, the, right now, the world's largest telescope is there. Uh, is it going to be there? We don't know, but it looks like it, because once the Hawaiian Supreme Court reversed the decision, they will have to go back and start the process all over again. Now, TMT was supposed to start construction about a decade ago. Uh, and so uh, the likelihood that they are going to go through that, they have to weigh it, and then is there any guarantee that they are going to get the permission again or not? Um, so I'm going to end with, is this an issue of science versus religion? And, well, short answer is no, because I've run out of time. Uh, but, but, uh, but it is about the, na religion is, should be in quotes here. Because it's about the native, uh, nature of native religions is different. Uh, in fact, the way there is a whole historical narrative of how religions have been constructed uh, in the 19th century, part of the colonial projects, and that's how, for example, uh, uh, Chinese religions are determined in a particular way because they were categories of how people should fit in to religion. Same thing with Hinduism. So non-monotheistic religions had to fit into categories. So same thing we try to do in a native religion. 
But in fact, uh, it's not necessarily the same kind of um, formal definitions that are going to be there. In the Hawaiian case, one of the complications is that, so who speaks for Native Hawaiians? Who's the head? Well, no, because you can have families have their own sacred valleys or own sacred peaks. And it's not just the peak, but the whole mountains, whole place counts. Second thing, uh, I'll just uh, skip over that, but just to mention, Scott Atran, who's a cognitive anthropologist, he's worked on sacred values, that when something is sacred, uh, then it's very hard to remove yourself from that. And when you offer money, like TMT was doing, like, hey, we are giving you $1 million, uh, but can we use the mountain? And Scott Atran's work suggested, he actually worked on Palestine and Israel issues, and he said that what he found that people would rather have an apology than money. And in fact, acknowledgement of their existence, acknowledgement of being there rather than money. So his research suggested on the Palestine-Israel issue that they would rather have, Palestinians would rather have an apology, but when they see money, they get more offended because they feel like you know, you're trying to buy, their, buy the injustice. Okay. So this may apply over here, uh, but needs more work to be done. But I would rather contextualize it with, it's not about science versus religion, but rather inquiry versus identity. Again, that goes back to this nationhood issue. I mean, for astronomers, we are focused about the inquiry aspect. But for Native Hawaiians, it's much bigger than that. For astronomers, they say, no, but the inquiry is the biggest thing. But it, again, if you look at the historical context, uh, you know, and then again, we need to have a historical perspective because that's really a central thing. Uh, I would have mentioned other things. I'm not going to. But I will uh, end with uh, this uh, Hawaiian saying, uh, which I'm not going to speak in Hawaiian, uh, and, but I will say Mauna Kea is an astonishing mountain that stands in the calm. And my suggestion right now for astronomers is we have to understand why there is a movement against the 30 meter telescope with all the historical context there is. Uh, as one, uh, one archaeologist uh, placed it in context and he said, you know, with the history of the United States, which includes the genocide of Native Americans and also built with slave trade. If TMT doesn't get built on Mauna Kea, that's a relatively small price. And I'll end up at that. Thank you.